What up, guys? It's your boy Pete, back here again with another video. Today, we're going to talk about the SAT freaking chemistry subject test. Oh, yeah. Chemistry. You're going to love it. Okay guys, now we're going to talk about the exam format. The SAT chemistry subject test is 85 questions. That's too long, that sucks. Just kidding. 85 questions in 60 minutes, 60 minutes is an hour. That's really, it's, it's pretty tough. So yeah, you're going to have to practice a lot and yeah, it's going to suck. But yeah, the first thing we need to talk about is sort of what types of questions are within those 85 questions. The first 25 are going to be matching, so you're going to have A, B, C, D, E, F. G H I J K L. Yeah, you're gonna have that the bunch of terms. You have to match them to a definition or a description or something. And yeah, that's pretty fun, but it's not too bad. And then the next part is gonna be the weird part, or usually it's in the middle, but sometimes it's at the end. But yeah, it's gonna be this. We're gonna give you two statements. Statement one, because. Statement two. So for an example, oxygen is neutral because, or statement one was oxygen is neutral because. Oxygen has equal number of protons and electrons. So for this, if they gave you those two statements, first you would identify if the statement one is true. Oxygen is neutral. An atom of oxygen is neutral, unless it's talking about ions, but it's not in this case. <coughs> so statement one is true. And then you're going to go into statement two. You're just going to look at statement two. Don't look at statement one anymore. Just statement two. Because oxygen has equal number of protons and electrons. An oxygen atom does have equal number of protons and electrons. That's true. So, you're going to say true for both of statement 1 and 2. Now you're going to read them together. Oxygen is neutral because oxygen has equal number of protons and equal number and electrons. So, you're going to see, does that make sense? Does the second statement justify the first statement? And in this case, it does. So, you're going to put true, true, and then you're going to fill in CE. They'll have a bubble for CE, and that stands for correct explanation. And if the second statement correctly explains the first statement, and they're both true statements, then you put that down. Yeah, but it gets a little bit weird. So I'll give you another example just to clarify. So let's say you have uh, H2S, or hydrogen sulfide, and if the statement says hey, H2S is polar. That's statement one, because H2S is a gas at room temperature. So now you're going to first evaluate uh, statement one. H2S is polar. And you, if you know your chemistry, it is polar because sulfur is more electronegative, much more electronegative than hydrogen, and that's uneven sharing of electrons. You get polar, you get a polar molecule. So then, in the next statement, you're going to evaluate just statement two. H2S is a gas at room temperature. Is it a gas at room temperature? So now you may be thinking, or in this case, it is. It is true. Like water is not a gas at room temperature, but sulfur, sulfur's uh, uh, electronegativity is a little bit less. Than waters, so it's not as an electronegative. So, yeah, I don't do I do I need to explain this right now? But yeah, so H2S is a gas at room temperature because the bonding isn't as strong. Did you guys get that? But yeah, so yeah, so now you've identified the statement one is true and statement two is true. But now you have to read it together to see if statement one and two, or statement two justify statement one. So H2S is polar because H2S is a gas at room temperature. That doesn't make sense because H2S isn't polar because H2S is a gas. That doesn't make sense at all. H2S is polar because sulfur has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen. That's why H2S is polar. It wants more electrons, but that's not, that is not a correct explanation the way they gave it to you. So you would fill in true, true, but you would leave CE blank. And that's sort of how the this section of the test works. So you have to really be careful. I always read statement one, evaluate whether it's true. Then statement two by itself. Don't think about statement one anymore. Evaluate if it's true or false. And if they're both true, then you can look and see if it's uh, fits all together. And yeah, that's kind of weird. And honestly, you miss, I missed a lot, a bunch of many questions like that on practice tests. But if you really isolate each statement and then answer the question, it really helps. And then the next part of the test is really complicated. It's a crazy complicated. Oh my gosh, you thought that a weird question. 
It's multiple choice. Yeah, just normal multiple choice, nothing crazy about it. Yeah, but it's a lot of multiple choice. So if you don't know your content, content it's going to suck. But if you do know your content, then good for you. It'll be just normal multiple choice. But yeah, on to the next part. Okay, so how did I prepare for the SAT chemistry subject test? So first things first, I did buy a book. It was the Princeton, or I bought two books actually. The Princeton Review SAT Chemistry Subject Test um, thing, book, review book. So yeah, it was pretty good. It covered pretty much everything, but there are a few things that I'm gonna, you're gonna need to go over more and I'll get to that in a second. And I also bought the official SAT Chemistry Subject Test Guide book thingy, the official one. Like It's got like two practice tests in it, like official ones. That's pretty important too because it has real practice tests. And I'll show you how I, like, I use those practice tests to sort of help, my, help me prepare and study for the test. <laughs> But yeah, so I did not take AP Chemistry or anything at this point. I had started taking it my senior year. So I had gotten maybe two weeks into it when I took the uh, SAT Chemistry subject test. So I didn't use the AP Chemistry to prepare. But after that, I do have some tips I can give AP Chemistry people. <clears throat> but first things first, how did I study? I used the Princeton Review book. And I also, and I feel like that book covered pretty much all the concepts pretty well. Like the concepts. And I think if you study that, like you're pretty much good for like all the, I, I don't think there were any concepts that were left out, but there are a few weird things that you're gonna have to know. And that, and I do have them written down here. So one thing I would know is the flame tests. So flame tests aren't really stressed in AP Chemistry and they're not stressed in the Princeton Review Book at too much. Like there's like a section, but yeah, you wanna know your flame tests and you also wanna know solubility and insoluble compounds. So solubility rules are actually really important. Like they'll ask you, is this soluble? And you're gonna be like, wait, what? I didn't learn that in chemistry yet. Cause you don't learn it in AP Chem, that it's not a big deal in AP Chem. You do learn basics and like through labs and stuff, you're gonna learn stuff. But yeah, you're gonna wanna really know your solid, look up solubility chart. And also you need to know their colors. Like these, not only do you not have to know if it dissolves, but if it doesn't dissolve or it dissolves, you wanna know what color it is. And that's also a big thing. Like metals have really uh, different color, like, a wide variety of colors so you want to really know generally which compounds have colors and then you also need to know like beta decay positron emission uh gamma particles all that weird crap so yeah the nuclear side of physics or, or, or chemistry i guess like the deep stuff like the deep stuff so yeah you need to know just basic knowledge of that not 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 very deep but you need to know some surface level just what is an alpha particle stuff like that and then the math part so math is pretty much covered in the book pretty well and ap chemistry also covers all your math if not in some cases more than enough but one thing it falls short is your freezing point and boiling point uh or your uh, freezing point uh and boiling point elevation and depression that sort of thing so like there's an equation that goes along with it and you need to study that equation because you may need it on the subject test chemistry, but you don't really use it in AP chemistry. I know, I don't think you included it in that. So that's important to know. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the scale and scoring. So subject tests are, all, are weird in that you lose one fourth of a point for every question that you miss. But, so this basically means that skipping a question is not the same thing as getting a question wrong. If you get a question wrong, it's actually worse than if you just skipped it. So that's different from the ACT and the normal SAT. So you need to be aware of that and uh, you need to count how many questions you're skipping throughout the test and be aware of how many questions you may or may not be missing and guessing wrong. But if you're going for an 800, the SAT chemistry, out of those 85 questions to get an 800, I think you want, if you skip like five or six and get everything else right, you should be good. But of course, if you, like uh, when I took it, I skipped about three questions because I knew I would probably get one or two wrong, definitely. And honestly, like you have to give a leeway. And I think the best way uh, to just prepare for this, rather than trust your inst trust your ability to like skip the right questions, I think you should just plan on getting everything right. Just plan on it, and then when it comes to it, you're gonna see a question that you don't know, and you can skip that one. Oh my gosh, puberty. Okay, so basically, that's the scale. You wanna be aware. But so then, after you've studied all the material, so I'm assuming you've really run through that Princeton Review book pretty well, gone through all the questions, taken those practice tests. Now you're on to the real practice tests, and I would save these for the la for last. 
And this is where I, so you're going to take those practices. The first one, you're going to run through it. You're going to start every question that you get wrong. And you're going to also, okay, you're going to start the questions that you struggled with and get wrong. I said that wrong. So both the ones that you struggled with and then after you go over the test, get the ones that you get wrong. And you're going to keep a wrong answer journal. And this is basically, you just go through every question that you struggled with and got wrong and you basically write down, why did I struggle with it or get it wrong? Uh, what concept did I lack or did I not know or what did what just what thought process led me to choose that answer and how to do better next time how to be quicker or how to get the question right next time and this is really important it helps you uh, clean up all the silly mistakes that you're making and it also helps you thoroughly under help you thoroughly understand the concepts correct correctly and get those questions right I don't even know did that make any sense well yeah wrong answer journal that's what I call so yeah, it's pretty great. I've talked about it in my other videos a lot, but it's super important. It really helps you get that perfection down. And yeah, basically you're gonna do that for the first practice test, and then you're gonna do it for the next practice test. And hopefully by that time you're getting at least a hundred. But actually, here's my experience with the test. So I took the practice test and I did not get anywhere close to an eight hundred. I got a seven sixty the first time, and then a seven forty the second practice test. So yeah. That spot was not good. That was literally like two days before the exam. And I somehow, I took the test the next day. And I honestly thought it was a lot better. It felt a lot better. But like I skipped like three or four questions. And there were a lot that I wasn't unsure about. I star questions when I go through it just so I can see which ones I'm struggling with. I can go back to those questions. I had like five to ten starred. So I think I personally got may have gotten a lucky scale. So that you may what be what happened with you happens on your test day, but it may not, or you may get an unlucky scale. So it really depends. Just really t be safe and aim for perfection. Name it. Just know all your material. And yeah, that's pretty much all my tips for regarding the content and regarding how to practice this stuff. Okay, now we're going to talk about general tips. So first things first, you want to get a good night's rest before the test day. Just get eight hours. Just get more than you usually do. I think that's the most important part. It'll really help your concentration, and uh, yeah, that will help you do better on the test. And then also, you want to stay hydrated. Your water water intake is super important. I know you're taking a test, and you want you don't want to have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the test, but just like just go to the bathroom right before getting into right before taking the test, and you should be good to go. And oh yeah, hydration is important. And so you want to also eat well. Uh, eat a good breakfast and get those carbs and protein in and then you also like sugar is not a bad thing like honestly like if you're taking multiple subject tests you should like eat sugar before then eat sugar after and really like just honestly the more you eat just the better as long as you don't feel sick but you don't want to just eat sugar like don't eat sugar just plain like don't eat like donuts for breakfast like you want to eat healthy and also add sugar on top of that both so Good luck with your life, with your SAT chemistry subject test. Chemistry is pretty hard. It's one of the hardest subjects. And, yeah, if you get a 100, that's money right there. It's good old cash. You gotta cash in on that stuff. But yeah, for real, I know, like, MIT requires these, and, like, some other institutions require it and recommend it. But if it's recommended, I really think you should take the subject test. So, yeah, good luck. Go get a freaking 800. Make your daddy.